Hey guys, what's going on? It's Nick here, back again with another documentary history video on the MBTA. Because, well, by popular demand, a lot of you want another one like the Orange Line video. And well, I had secretly been working on this for around a few months now. And well, I had compiled a script together back in November of 2020, and I had just suddenly forgotten about it, and I thought that it had accidentally gotten deleted, but just recently I found it and I've been working on it again, and it's finally in a state where I'm able to present it as a video. So this video is going to be pretty similar to that of the Orange Line video, except the fact that I'm going to include every single bit of history in this video, and I'm not going to be skipping over a ton of facts, and just assuming things like I did in the Orange Line video. I did a ton of research on this, and I know what I'm talking about, and it's even backed by my editor, shout out to him by the way, Thank you so much for getting, helping me get this video out. It's been a lifesaver. It would have taken me months to edit the whole script that I, had, that I had written before. So, thank you for that. But yes, this video will contain two things. A history of the line and the infrastructure, and a history on the train cars themselves. So that is what we will be discussing today. So, without further ado, let's get started on the history of the MBTA Red Line of Boston, Massachusetts. Let's get started. So, the Red Line started back in 1912 under the naming scheme of the Boston Elevated Railway. However, this line would not be elevated unlike the Orange Line, since, well, the original line spanned from Cambridge all the way to Dorchester, and because of that, it was named the Cambridge-Dorchester Line, and it wasn't called the Red Line until 1965 after the MBTA was formed. And I will explain why it was called the Red Line in the first place, so stick around for that later. So the line spanned from Harvard Terminal to Park Street where it met with the Green Line, and this was called the Cambridge Tunnel, since the line was underground for, for the majority of the time, the only time it actually came above ground was when it was crossing over the Longfellow Bridge. And well, this line was predicted to open in 1911, however there were some delays around the opening of the Cambridge Tunnel. Residents of the Cambridge area were wanting at least five stations to be built. And while the Boston Elevated Railway had originally planned to have only the stations of Harvard and Park be stops, and, and the residents wanted intermittent stations to fill up the massive gap. And well, can you blame them? I mean, the walk from Park Street to Harvard was pretty far, and, and while the mayor of Cambridge got enough complaints from the residents that they wanted this changed, so he decided to take this to the MTA himself. And well, the MTA and the mayor of Cambridge came to an agreement, and they decided to build two intermittent stations of Kendall and Central. And that evenly spread apart the stations, and allowed people to ride the train without having to walk so far. And well, in 1912, construction officially began with the tunnels being bored, and the following stations of Harvard, Kendall, Central, and Park Street being built. And the Cambridge-Dorchester line officially opened to the public on March 23rd of 1912. And while some of you might be asking, what about Charles MGH? And while Charles was renamed Charles MGH in 1973, but it was originally built in 1952 as the fifth station to the Cambridge-Dorchester line. And the station was positioned right in the center of the Charles traffic circle, and with the foot of the bridge being built, and that pretty much sums up the whole stop. While the current line was in operation, the Dorchester Tunnel Extension was in the works and the extension made the connection to the Washington Street Tunnel, which is now Downtown Crossing Station, where the red line officially met the orange line, and extended the line further into Boston and into Dorchester. And by 1915, new, a new station was added, which was Washington Street, which is now officially Downtown Crossing, and South Station was built in 1915. In the following years, the stations of Broadway and Andrew were built. Once the Dorchester Tunnel was finished being constructed, the new Dorchester Extension line was being built soon after. The Dorchester Extension, which is now the Ashmont line, included the stations of Columbia, which is now JFK UMass, Savin Hill, Fields Corner, Shawmut, and of course, Ashmont. Although an interesting fact about this line is that the, it was organized by the MTA and the Old Colony Railroad. And a little bit of backstory here, the Old Colony Railroad operated what is now the Mattapan Ashmont line. The reason why they did this was so that they could connect the red line to the mattapan Ashmont line. And this portion of the line was completed in 1929, and to top it all, 
the, uh, the Shaw branch was acquired by the MTA during this time and was rebranded to the Ashmont Mattapan High Speed Line in 1929. Once the Dorchester had opened to the public, not much about the Red Line changed from 1929 to around 1969. However, the exciting thing that happened to the line was it being rebranded under the newly formed MBTA in 1964. The Cambridge Dorchester line was officially under the ownership of the MBTA and received a brand new name and was officially changed to the Red Line in 1965. And fun fact, the reason why the color red was chosen is actually rather interesting which I will dive into right now. The reason why the red line is called the red line is because the line went through the terminal station of Harvard, and Harvard Station is right under the grounds of Harvard University. And while Harvard University is associated with a crimson red color, and since the line went through the area of Harvard University, it was suiting to name the line the red line since, well, the color of Harvard is red, so why not just put the whole line as red? So. In 1965, the MBTA named the Cambridge Dorchester line the Red Line. Also, a bit of a tangent, I might as well tell you why the other lines are named the way they are. The Red Line was named Red because it ran by Harvard University, as I just explained. The Blue Line was named the Blue Line because it ran under the watery depths of the Boston Harbor. And the Green Line was chosen because the Green Line runs along the Frederick Law Olmsted Emerald Necklace Parks. And the orange line was named orange because it ran beneath a part of, wa of Washington Street, and that portion of Washington Street was originally called Orange Street, which is why the orange line is called orange. Since I've always lived here growing up, I've always wondered why each line was named the way that, it, that it's been named. And well, this sums it up, and I'm glad I learned this, because I think it's really cool. And well, let's get back to the history, shall we? And in 1969, plans to expand the Red Line were in the works, and the MBTA signed an agreement with the New Haven Railroad and purchased around 11.2 miles of empty land to extend the Red Line further. This was known as the South Shore slash Braintree Extension, and the construction of the Braintree Extension began that year and was completed in 1975. And the stations of Quincy Center, Wollaston, North Quincy were built. And while that portion of the project was known as the South Shore Extension, the Braintree Extension was built soon after, and in 1980, Braintree was officially completed, and the stations of Quincy Adams and Braintree were built, officially completing both extensions and completing the project. But on the other side of the line, changes to the line were being made, with station abandonments and relocations, along with another extension! And from the years 1980 to 1985, the stations of Porter, Davis, and Elwife were built, in which this extension was officially referred to as the Elwife Extension, but at the time it was originally known as the Lexington Expansion, since, well, the red line was starting to get close into Lexington, Massachusetts, so the name seemed suiting. But when Elwife Station was built in 1985, they decided to change it to the Elwife Expansion. In addition to the stations of Porter, Davis, and Elwife being built, the station of Harvard was in a bit of a limbo zone at this time. Um, Harvard station was actually just completely abandoned and rebuilt only just a few thousand feet away. I am not joking. The abandoned station of Harvard is still there. You pass by it every time you go from Harvard to... The Central. I think that's right. I can't... Yeah, Central. In addition to these stations being built, Harvard was relocated, only just a few thousand feet away. The original Harvard station was completely abandoned and rebuilt just a few thousand feet away. And well, the reason why is that the infrastructure of the Red Line had changed, and the way that Harvard was built, it couldn't really be modified from its original shell. Since, well, if they were to try to modify the station to add maybe six car platforms, there was a very high chance of tunnel collapse. And while they didn't want to they didn't want to risk that, so they decided to keep boring and just decide to put the new station right just like a thousand feet away. So the MBTA, the MBTA decided to completely abandon Harvard Station, and they just built a brand new one just around the corner. And, well, if you're wondering what happened to that abandoned Harvard Station, well, it's still sitting there, to this day, in its original state. Not, it hasn't been touched since 1985, although some of the valuables have been stripped away by the actual MBTA maintenance crew as to make sure nobody was sneaking in there and stealing stuff and possibly hurting themselves. And the new Harvard station was a lot bigger. 
it allowed for a new six car platform, which was being implemented in the new MBTA era. Continuing on, the Alwife extension was being built and the stations of Alwife in particular was being built in a magnificent way. The station featured a retro modern design with an expansive six car platform and amazing forms of art all around the station. A platform featured red neon tubes which were called the red line and the station also featured murals, artwork, sculptures and architecture that was attuned to be more artsy and since 1985 to 2006, not much had changed on the red line. Although, in 2006, the MBTA decided to give Charles MGH a brand new redesign, and they completely tore down the old structure that they had and built up this ultra-modern glass st structure of a station where Harvard used to be. They left the base platform there, but built this ultra-modern sleek glass, I guess you could call it a container, around the station, which allowed for a new terminal, which allowed for easy accessibility with new elevators and all sorts of other cool stuff. And that was built in 2006. And since 2006, not much has changed about the red line. And well, let's just, let's just shoot our focus from the lines and the stations, and let's just discuss about the rolling stock now. So I will be mostly talking about the train cars in this bit of the video, and I will be talking a little bit about how they operate, as well as a few other things. And I will also be talking about all the changes that have happened throughout the years since the line officially opened. So let's begin with that. So we're first going to begin with the cars that the line first opened up with. These cars were built by Standard Steel Company and Laconia Car Company in 1914, and were on the line in 1915. And the design of these cars were similar to that of the other lines, with the exterior design being similar to that of a street trolley car, and not quite a typical modern subway car. And there were 60 cars on the line in total. The dimensions of these cars were 69 feet long and 9.5 feet wide, and they weighed just shy of 86,000 pounds. And these cars received the longest time in service from 1912 to 1964, when the whole fleet was replaced by the 1963 Pullman Standard 1400s. And well, the Pullman Standard 1400s were an extreme difference to that of the previous fleet. These cars used a brand new, now universally adopted subway standard car design, and which this design featured a rather slim rectangular design with a few different quirks on it and three sets of doors on each side, and the cab design was redesigned to be more space efficient. And these cars were very interesting since they were implemented onto the line before the MBTA had been established. These cars were made from carbon steel and sported a slick color scheme of dark blue, a trim of gold, and white. And these cars featured reinforced steel roofs and other features such as st more standing areas and handrails. And looking at these cars, these cars just scream the 1950s. I mean, look at this interior. This is like straight out of 1950, you know? Not like anything's wrong with that, I'm just pointing it out because I find it pretty cool. These cars replaced the previous fleet by 1963 and were unique in a few different ways. One is that the design of the cars were similar to that of the design that was used for the Orange Line fleet, which are the 1100s. And well, interesting about this fleet is the color scheme. And while you might be wondering, why wasn't the color scheme the typical uh, stone gray roof, white, and then red on the bottom, like it always has been? And well, that's because the colors were chosen to match the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which actually helped to fund the purchase of these cars. And the color scheme remained the same until around 1980 when the Alwife extension opened, in which the cars received a brand new paint scheme overhaul with now the classic MBTA red line look of the red for the bottom, white for the top half, and then the stone gray roof. These cars remained in service until 1994 when they were replaced by the 1800s, but the reason why they were replaced was due to a few different factors here. One of them was maintenance, hardware limitations, as well as just general reliability and aesthetics. So let's just dive into that now. And while due to the design that Pullman Standard had created for these cars, they were only capable of handling up to four cars or two married couple trains. And well, this created a bit of a hassle since well, since well, the MBTA had already shifted to six car trains for the 15 and 1600s and while the 1400s were a bit different, since well, they were only limited to a four car train, 
and while the MBTA attempted to push the limitations of these cars, but then ended up in the electrical and mechanical systems failing completely, which uh, resulted in a few um, <coughs> fires. And also, these cars did not come with air conditioning. You heard me right, ladies and gentlemen. These cars did not have air conditioning. It's a necessity now, but I don't know who the hell was in charge to tell them, oh, let's just skip out on the air conditioning, man, it's fine. But yeah, these cars did not have air conditioning, so on hot summer days, particularly when they broke down, these cars were not fun to be in. And another cool factoid is that a certain couple of cars, that a certain pair of these cars that were delivered to the MBTA had a different front design to them. And while cars number 1490 and 1491 had this different design change. And while the MBTA was cool with this, and it added a bit of exclusivity to the red line for a little bit. And well, unfortunately, uh, car number four, 1490 was destroyed in a yard fire, and 1491 was eventually scrapped once all the others were scrapped, and did not make it to the Seashore Trolley Museum, unfortunately. Alongside the 1400s, the MBTA actually ordered a different car for the red line as well. And these cars are the aluminum bodied Silverbirds or the 15 and 1600s. And these cars were manufactured from 1969 to 1970. And the 1500s and 1600s were a technological leap compared to the previous fleet purchased in 1963. These cars featured an all new design that addressed some issues from the previous design particularly when it came to efficiency. These cars featured a modern body with in-body sliding doors, a new traction motor and brake compressor design, similar to that of the Hawker Sydney 1200s, which are the Orange Line fleet. And while you could say that the Hawker Sydney 1200s actually copied the Red Line since, well, since these cars were built before the 1200s were. So, that's a cool interesting factoid, huh? And along with these cars came an upgrade signal technology and electrical wiring which finally allowed for a three coupled train or a six car train or three pairs of married couples which is two trains so it would be like two two and two we got that we math and okay okay good and these cars were 69 feet long and 10 feet wide and had a new cab design and sat at least 64 people in them and other improvements to the interior cars were a larger cab design with space for more standing as well as leather covered seats instead of the plastic from the older fleet. And now as far as the exterior, the reasons why these cars were called the Silverbirds is because of the livery they used from 1969 to 1980 and it featured an all silver anodized aluminum with a red stripe bordering the middle of the car and the natural aluminum finish made these cars seem silver and that's where they got the name the Silverbirds. And there were 68 cars in total of the 15 and 1600s, and they were given a midlife overhaul in the 1980s when the MBTA opened the L-Wife extension to the public. And the MBTA decided to later in 1987 to order 58 identical cars to that of the 15 and 1600s, but these cars were built by UTDC, since well, Pullman Standard was no longer a company by 1980. And these cars still remain in service to this day, with only 9 total cars of the 1600s being taken out of service for parts and reliability issues. Up until then, the Red Line fleet was operating steadily, and by the 1990s and around then, the MBTA had been doing some changes to the infrastructure on the Red Line, and changing many of the 4-car platforms to 6-car platforms. And while the old 1400s were a growing concern, and well, like in the reasons that I stated before, and I could see why people at the MBTA would be concerned about that. And in 1991, the MBTA had tried to look for a new car manufacturer to replace the very outdated 1400s, and the MBTA ended up selecting Bombardier to build this new red line fleet, and in 1993, the first of the 1800 series hit the rails with an absolutely massive departure in both design and technology from that of the Pullman standards. And these cars were ultra modern for 1993 and were considered by the MBTA and many others to be a much needed addition to the line. And these cars were built by Bombardier and were identical in dimensions to that of the 15 and 1700s that the T used. Although a massive difference from these cars were the technology that this car used in comparison to the fleet it was replacing. The fleet featured an all new accurate real time signal system and red. LED interior signs, as well as yellow LED exterior signs, 
displaying like the destination and whatnot. And the trains also came with a brand new undercarriage design and electrical system with an all new traction motor and propulsion controller, wider doors and an automated stop system that was voiced by the famous Frank Oglesby. Let's listen to that voice now, shall we? No smoking, please. The destination of this train is Braintree, entering North Quincy. Next stop, Wollaston. Next stop, Quincy Center. In the 1800 series were a massive boost to ridership since the reliability of the line was increased by a lot. But let's talk about design. These cars featured a sleek stainless steel exterior with uniform sidings. And these cars featured four pairs of doors instead of just three, which allowed for people to go in and out a lot easier. And these cars were a lot more durable since the stainless steel is a lot more stronger than that of normal steel and it is a lot less susceptible to rust and corrosion and general deterioration after a prolonged period of time of being in the natural elements. And these cars came with brand new safety measures along with the stunning design. There was a brand new propulsion controller design which was a massive overhaul to the previous controller design that was used by the 1400s, which I will dive into in a little bit. This design used a single hand operated lever that was spring loaded and could only be moved if an operator pushed on it. And this was a massive safety improvement since if the lever were to suddenly be let go it would spring back into the locked position and would turn the traction motor into neutral and automatically apply the brakes by default. However this technology had been used before and it was actually incorporated into the, into the 15 and 1700 fleet but the main difference was that the brakes would only apply once the operator stick was all the way in the default top spring load position. That is called the dead man's failsafe feature, which I do explain this a bit more in my MBTA runaway redline video. And if you want to see that video, go ahead and click the I card right here and you can go check it out there. With this new technology, the 1800s would be a lot safer and tamper proof, as I stated in the other video. And with this improvement to the actual operation of the train, the MBTA had to train the operators of how to use this new technology that was being introduced. And with the 1800s on the line, the 1400s were retired and scrapped, and cars number 1450 and 1455 were donated to the Seashore Trolley Museum where they are being preserved. And well, they're not in the best condition, but they work, which is good in my book at least. And from 1993 to today, nothing really has changed about the red line besides the 15, 16, and 1700s aging quite rapidly, breaking down. Uh, once again, folks, we do apologize for the delay. Uh, we should be, uh, this should be in about uh, three or four minutes. So we'll be sending more information to you once we get the train moving in a moment. We do apologize for the delay. We should be moving in a moment. Reliability issues and other problems have caused major issues in recent years, since they have played a key role in some of the decisions that the MBTA has made to the line. Incidents such as the runaway train, and as well as the recent derailment in 2019, and these incidents had all, have ultimately caused the MBTA to seek out and replace the 15, 16, and 1700s. And in 2013, the MBTA was in a bit of a... They were kind of in a bit of a shithole at the time. The orange line was breaking down and the, and the red line was breaking down a lot more than the orange line, I would say. And well, the MBTA was trying to look for new train cars to replace the ever so aging 15 and 16 and 1700s. And well, the MBTA had originally been looking to replace the orange line 1200 fleet since while well, those were in desperate need of replacing, since while well, the 1200s never really received the 1980s rebuild that the 14, 15, and 1600s did. And while well, in 2013, the MBTA held an auction with the top subway car manufacturers to see who would build these next red line cars. And while well, CRRC won the contract and began prototyping of the, the orange line 1400s as well as the red line 1900s. And well, let's just dive into a little bit about the design of the 1900s. So the 1900s sport a similar design to that of the 1800s, but with rather noticeable changes. The front of the train car is black plastic with a bright red ring going around the front. The whole body is stainless steel 
with the red vinyl livery covering the sides, but not the doors for some weird reason, which I honestly think is like the grossest design change that they could have chosen. Like, why would you put doors and not put the livery on them? Like, that's what the current trains are like. Why not just keep doing that? It looks good. Plus, it's iconic. And with the 1900s and their amazing design, they also came with brand new safety and technology improvements. The new technology improvements were an all new traction mode design with the brand new AC in intake as well as air compression system and signal system, which I cover a little bit more on the Orange Line video, but I will skip over that for time's sake. And so, you might be wondering when do the 1400s begin service? Well, they are actually in service right now. Um, the 1400s will be completely replacing the Pullman standard 15, 16, and 1700s by 2024, although probably 2025 due to the effects of the pandemic on manufacturing and production of these cars. And while the 1900s I think fit in really well, and I think they will be a good improvement to that of the MBTA for infrastructure, reliability, and just general aesthetics as well. And well, with all of this information in your head now, this sums up today's video. And well, I really hope all of you, I mean, and I mean all of you, enjoyed this video. This has been a video that has been long overdue. I should have pushed this out a long time ago, but other things came up as well as school and other things, but you don't really care. But, um, but yeah, this video has been a long time coming, and I will be sure to make more of this. If you want to suggest what line I do next, please let me know in my Discord server, send me a DM over on Twitter, and also just put in the comments below what you want to see next, and I will definitely listen to you. I read the comments section, and I reply, and I read them. So, if you want to leave a comment, like complimenting me, giving me criticism, go right ahead. I don't really mind. Since, well, feedback, any feedback is good feedback. And well, I just want to thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and ring the bell to get notifications for whenever I post. And, as always, this is Nick, signing off. I will see you all in the next video. Bye-bye!